Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so today uh, I want to talk to you about uh, collagen degrading proteases in Dipatrin's disease, fibroblast mediated contraction. There we go. Okay, so I've got nothing uh, to disclose. Um, firstly, I'd just like to uh, speak to you about the Norwich Dipatrin's Group UK. Uh, this is a group that I'm associated with at the moment, um, and this is alongside local um, people who are um, involved in surgery, uh, clinicians, uh, hand therapists, and scientists like myself. And we're able to network um, and take depictions to the next level, hopefully. So just a, a brief bit about myself. Um, so I studied for my PhD at the University of East Anglia, um, and this was the, key, the extracellular matrix proteins in the vitreous humour. And then I was lucky enough to be able to join the Ian Clark's uh, laboratory, um, which is my first postdoctoral position where I am at the moment. And it's the reason why I'm sitting or standing here. Um, it's looking at Dipitrin's disease. Um, and this is also at the University of East Anglia. And uh, as you can see um, on the picture, hopefully you can see there um, quite uh, clearly, there's a the University of East Anglia. Um, and it's just a stone's throw away uh, from the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital, uh, which is where we get our Dipitrin's um, tissue from, and also where we can network with um, our surgeons. <coughs> so as for my research interests, obviously um, I'm interested in the uh, matrix metalloproteinase family um, and their involvement in cell-mediated contraction in Dipitrin's disease. Okay, so collagen, you've just had a really great talk actually about collagen, so, uh, so you're well prepared for this, but we know it's important for the pathology of Dipitrin's disease, and it is due to its excessive deposition. Um, collagen is constantly being synthesized and degraded, um, it's in this kind of dynamic equilibrium, and it's well regulated. I say it's well regulated, actually re the regulation then fa uh, fails in Dipitrin's disease, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Okay, so this is to do with the regulation of our uh, collagen. These are the metalloproteinases and their inhibitors, and I'm just going to go through, um, take you through these now. So we've got our MMPs, which are the matrix metalloproteinases, of which there are 23 uh, human enzymes. The ones we're interested in are the ones which break down the collagen, the collagenases, and these are MMP 1, 8, 13, 2, and 14. These themselves need to be regulated, and this is through use of the TIMPs, the tissue inhibitors of metalloproteinases, of which there are four, TIMPs 1 through to 4. Um, and uh, these have got quite a high affinity to our um, collagenase MMPs, all with the exception of MMP14, which I'm going to come to a little bit later. Then we have, have our ADAMTSs, a disintegrated and metalloproteinase domain with thrombosbondin motifs of which there's 19, um, and these are pro-collagen and pro-peptidases, the ones we're in, they're a very, very diverse group actually, uh, but the ones we're interested in are Adam TSS 2, 3 and 14, because these are the ones that synthesise collagen. So in normal tissue, are, as you can see over there, I don't know if I've got my pointer, and there it is. So um, if we look in this first diagram here, we have our TIMPs and our MMPs perfectly balanced. This is in normal tissue and it allows normal collagen turnover uh, to prevail. And then in our second of the uh, diagrams on here, uh, we can see that the balance has been um, kind of tipped in favour of our TIMPs. And this is what happens in fibrotic disorders such as Dipitrin's disease. You get excessive collagen deposition due to the fact that the TIMPs are inhibiting our MMPs and so more and more collagen is laid down. Okay, so all theory is quite good, but what about evidence uh, for the MMPs and the TIMPs to be involved um, in Dipitrin's disease? Well, um, if we first go to the cancer clinics and studies that have been done there, um, particularly um, in, a, in a study where uh, terminal gastric carcinoma patients were given broad-spectrum MMP inhibitors, these patients um, ended up, unfortunately, getting frozen shoulder-like sim uh, symptom symptoms and also uh, Dipitrin's-like symptoms. Um, and as soon as these uh, inhibitors were then uh, taken away from the patients, these symptoms also seemed to, um, to become uh, much better for them. Uh, so there does seem to be some kind of link there. 
But then when this kind of, uh, when this was actually taken then back into the uh, laboratory, unfortunately they found something slightly different, that when these inhibitors were given to the cells, this actually reduced the contraction by the dipitrin cells. So it's a bit of a paradox on the go here. Um, and then finally, um, we've also um, seen uh, that dipitrin's um, patient sera has also been looked at, and again, this ratio of TIMP to MMP um, balance um, has been seen to be dysregulated, and of course, this ends up in um, collagen deposition. Okay, so what we're going to go on to here is um, a, a paper which was completed by our group uh, in 2007, and this was headed up by um, Philip Johnston. Um, and uh, he was able to take Dipitrin's research one step further by looking at a complete expression profile of the MMPs in Dipitrin's disease. So these are the results he found. Now I'm not going to go through all of this, but what I want you to look at is uh, MMP1, 13 and 14, because these are our collagenases. Um, and uh, what we have here is our gene expression, or oh, if I can find a pointer, um, on the y-axis, and in each of the cases of these collagenases um, and uh, the normal versus uh, nodular, um, can, uh, normal versus nodular, um, oh gosh, the word's gone, normal versus <laughs> uh, nodular kind of controls, we can see that uh, the collagenases are actually upregulated um, in the nodular tissue, which is really interesting, and we can also see this in our TIMPs. Here we go, so TIMP1, once again, you can see that it's upregulated. Now, Philip Johnson then took this one step further by um, looking at this, this, the, the same data, but actually then correlating it uh, with post-surgical reoccurrence in Dipitrin's disease. And as such, maybe um, gene expression could be um, used to predict the clinical outcome. Okay, so for my current research at the moment, I'm looking at fibroblast populated collagen lattices. Um, this is used to measure cell-mediated uh, contraction, um, and I use it as a surrogate for um, the contraction in Dipitrin's disease. And what we do, in fact, actually, I think it's already been spoken about already, is we seed Dipitrin's nodular uh, fibroblasts into collagen type 1 gel. Um, we allow the, the fibroblasts to develop tension. Uh, we then come along, release them, um, and these gels contract. And you can see here, um, I've got four uh, Dipitrin's uh, primary cell lines, all contracting over time. I've also got a, uh, a schematic across the top there of um, the gels under tension and then contracting. Um, and you can see the kinetics of all these are very similar. And, okay, um, and so another area we've been very interested in looking at using these FPCLs is collagen degradation. So we um, were looking to see if collagen degrades during contraction, and we used a hydroxyproline assay um, to be able to do this, of which I'm not going to involve you all in at the moment. You can always come and ask me about it. But basically, this looks um, at um, the amino acid proline, um, and so proline is used as our target. Um, and uh, you can see that the amount of collagen degraded actually increases during our tension, um, but even more so to a greater extent you, uh, during release. And we are kind of suggesting from this that maybe collagen contraction and collagen degradation go hand in hand. Okay, again, so using these FPCLs, I wanted to look at MMPs and their inhibitors and in terms of gene expression. Um, so these are my gene expression results. I must just say that I looked at actually quite a, um, a variety of um, MMPs, Adam Tieses and TIMPs, but I'm just showing you these uh, few a subset here um, just for now. So what we have is our gene expression of MMP1, 13, 3 and TIMP1. And what I want to show you here is we have a control which is ML, monolayer. So these are cells that have had no manipulation at all, basal amounts of gene expression happening. Then we have um, cell, uh, gels that have been placed under tension, and then we also have release. And you can see yeah, in each of these, we get quite a similar response under tension. And as soon as they're released over time, we can see there is a peak 
of gene expression in all of these. Uh, this is probably with the exception of MMP13, which seems to have just a general increase, and this is probably due to response of the cells being in a 3D matrix. Uh, TIMP1 here is particularly interesting as well, because you can see that the units of gene expression here go up to 500. Well, look at that compared to some of these here, 4, uh, 10, and 1.4 here. So something really interesting is happening. We're getting a really massive amount of gene expression for TIMP1, which, going back to our previous um, slide that I showed you, um, where the, the TIMPs are imbalanced, um, or the weight, it's what they're weighted in favour of the TIMPs, you can see this is illustrated really quite well um, in my gene expression values. So going back to MMP3, not only can we look at gene expression, but we can also, oops, wrong way. We can also look at the enzyme activity of MMP3. And this is using um, a, a method called KC enzymography. And hopefully you can see fairly well, I think you can. Um, when the casein um, is being used as a substrate by um, MMP3, you can see that there's some bright bands. Now under tension, we have um, very little uh, uh, amounts of, uh, of gene, uh, sorry, of enzyme activity, but as soon as they're released, you can see there's um, quite bright bands seen here, and this fits in again quite well with my, uh, very well actually, with my gene expression results. So on to a little bit more gene expression again, um, and uh, this is under the same format once again. So looking at MMP14 and MMP2. Um, notice that the uh, same pattern isn't, isn't quite so obvious and clear here. However, what is interesting again is the units of gene expression are really rather high um, compared to um, our other MMPs. So this brings us um, to a, a kind of a, a conclusion here that even in the presence of TIMP1, of which there appeared to be an awful lot of uh, gene expression of this, Degradation is still taking place. Well, we know the degradation is still taking place from my hydroxyproline uh, assay result that I showed you earlier. So what exactly is happening? Well, we think the collagen degradation um, is due to MMP14. This is because MMP14 um, isn't inhibited by TIMP1. And so we think it, it, it um, is able to maintain its collagenolytic activity. Not only this, but MMP14 is said to um, activate MMP2, and so maybe they kind of work hand in hand or are kind of partners in crime to be able to uh, not only um, degrade the collagen, but also allow contraction to happen. So as for my ongoing work, I want to define which, which of the MMPs are key in, coll in collagen gel contraction. This is going to be using siRNA techniques. In fact, just last week I was able to knock down MMP14 in my Dipitrin's nodular fibroblasts. And I'm hoping to take these transfected cells, put them into my FPCLs, um, and use them against my, uh, my normal non-manipulated Dipitrin cells uh, and see whether they're able to contract the gels less. Then also discover if these are also responsible for collagen degradation, again using my hydroxyproline assay, and hopefully this will allow us to understand the system and provide us with a potential drug target. Um, so there's lots of people here that I'd like to thank. Um, I'll let you read through those, but I must uh, certainly thank um, the Furlong Research um, Trust and also the Gwendolyn Fish Trust for um, providing money for my research, and the BSMB and the UKRC for giving me the money to be here in Miami today. So I'm very thankful to them and thankful for you for listening to me. Thank you very much.